Beautiful, divine. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Um, yeah. So I think now we've got to talk um, about the start about Darwin Shaw, facilitated by Jeff. If you haven't met Jeff, he's from the States, works at the Centre on Metal Beach, caretaker there, has been working there for 30 years, avid volleyball player, and also as a you know, what is it, 25 years of Sahaba Sea? You've been there, how many years? Yep, yep. So. The youngest Sahaba Sea. Yeah. <laughs> Slowly but surely. Um, but before we have that, right, actually, have a pretty funny story about Jess. Yes. I have a very funny story about Jess. Oh, <laughs> standing up. I, um, I went to, when I first went to Sahaba I, um, just like every other time, originally decided to go for a certain period of time and uh, ended up staying for an extra month longer than what it was expected. Just because of my kind of, my personality means I'm usually gonna ruin every plan that is set out for me to do. <laughs> so unfortunately, or well fortunately for me, Jeff um, allowed me to stay on center or like, you know, the, the center allowed me to stay on and um, do some community work or, you know, help clean the cabins. Jeff usually uh, picks out or hand picks out a certain amount of people to help clean the cabins. And um, I just kind of really wanted to. And, uh, you know, it took a while for Jeff to make sure that my standards were up to scratch, maybe like two or three weeks. And after I think that I fully have, you know, exceeded his standards of cleaning the cabins, um, he uh, decided it would be a fun, a fun thing to, to con me into tying myself to a tree and leaving me there <laughs> for a good 20 minutes without the, the, without the escape route. Physically you don't have any, any rope, you're just kind of tied and tucked into like a, a position that you're stuck in that tree. I, I doubt anyone here could try and get out of it. Maybe Jeff. But that's I guess the, the most loving thing Jeff. It was a beautiful moment. You tied the knot. That was beautiful. It's my favourite story I've ever I have of us. There's lots of them. Take it away, Jeff. Okay. Take it away, Jeff. So, uh, have most of you uh, met, uh, have any of you met Darwin Shaw? So, a few of you have met Darwin. Hey, are you getting that little reverb or something? <clears throat> um, and uh, he never came to Australia, but he did go sometimes to India. <clears throat> but anyway, I'll just tell you a little bit about Darwin. Uh, <clears throat> he was, uh, he grew up in upstate New York, and when he, from an early age, he had the presence of Jesus. You know, he had that experience. <clears throat> and he went to church, and he liked the stories about Jesus, the life and everything. But he, as he went along, nobody seemed to talk about actually experiencing the companionship. They were, you know, mainly talking about belief in Jesus, where he, he had this rare thing where he was enjoying the company. And when he was 17, he went out west, and where he worked as a cowboy, and under these huge skies and vast expanses of land, he, he led a contemplative, contemplative life. <clears throat> and, you know, with the companionship of uh, Jesus there. And at one point, on a second trip, he felt, this is back in, you know, probably 1930, he felt that Christ was, uh, deep down, he felt Christ was on the earth again, and that he would meet him. <clears throat> and so, he came back to New York, he met, um, Gene, his lifelong partner, who's a bit of a character. Uh, <clears throat> and one day he was looking in the newspaper and he saw a little article, uh, just a filler. You know, they, sometimes if a newspaper wasn't able to finish a column, they would plug in a filler, the stories that they would get from the Associated Press and plug it in there. <clears throat> and it mentioned Mayor Baba and a few of his disciples coming to the West. And he felt this, this could very well be the price. And, and then a, a while later, another article appeared maybe six months later, and this time uh, it gave where he was. They didn't have the internet, so you, you know, someone was coming, how are you gonna contact him? But 
He would, this time, Bob was going to be in upstate New York, just a little bit outside of New York City. And so he went down to see Bob, and he missed him by one day. This is 1932. But, but Bob just filled him with his presence. So he felt that he met Bob in spirit that time. In 1934, he made sure that he didn't miss Bob at this time. He was in the hotel lobby <coughs> waiting with the G waiting for Baba as he got off to the boat and came. And he was ushered into the lobby. And he said when his eyes met Baba's, he saw that pure, infinite love in his eyes. He had he, he was much loved in his life, but he had never seen divine love. And he could tell from Baba's looking at him that, that in spite of all of his weaknesses and shortcomings and hang-ups, Baba loved him unconditionally. He never quite seen something like that. So Norena brought a, a Darwin over to D Darwin and Jean, and Baba put out his hand like this, and he said that hand came across 2,000 years, and it was like uh, reliving the pages of the New Testament. And so he went on to have a magnificent inner life with Baba, and uh, Darwin was like the perfect ambassador for Baba um, among us young people because he was very low-key, unassuming, <clears throat> and he wasn't like some preacher that was trying to ram the gospel down his throat. Yet you could see that he, um, you know, he, he was sitting on a treasure of Baba's love. And what we uh, learned that if we asked him que questions about uh, the inner life, we could actually draw some of that treasure out. And this book here <coughs> was one of the byproducts of effort and grace, the by byproduct of the questions we asked him. <coughs> but he was, Darwin was kind of like a, a wine barrel uh, filled with rare wine, and we were a bunch of winos. And we just went around <laughs> and punched holes in the side. <laughs> you know, but we were actually, we were not quite that brazen. <clears throat> but anyway, so <clears throat> at the outset, I want to say that that there's many Baba lovers whose outer life embodies their inner life. So their outer life embodies the love and, and service and remembrance of Baba. And that's a beautiful thing. And uh, we're blessed to have people like that. And then there are others like myself whose nature is inclined to, uh, to consciously experience the inner life of Father. <clears throat> and so what, uh, this is going to be hard to describe <clears throat> how uh, Darwin viewed the inner life. Because the inner life with Baba is it's somewhere between the physical and the non-physical, the border between the physical and the non-physical. And English <clears throat> doesn't have a vocabulary for that. The Sufis did, but uh, you know, English language doesn't touch that because it's a lot of it is in the non is in the non-physical realm, but it interfaces with the physical body. So you have like <clears throat> the heart, <clears throat> the physical heart. And then we say, oh, he was did something from his heart. Well, where does that heart, you know, where is that located? Then there's the, the heart of hearts. Where is that? All these things are there. <clears throat> and, I mean, it's not, this isn't like abstract. This is terminology for inner experience. But anyway, so I'm going to try to um, give you an idea of... Uh, of Darwin's description. <clears throat> it's not like a place at the back of the, of the head or the mind. The place where I was back in my college days, you know, back there looking at the world kind of uh, somewhat um, critically, you know. It's not the back of the head. It's at the back of the heart. But it's where the inner heart, our inner heart, um, interfaces with the realm of the spirit, the timeless realm. It's one of Baba's uh, major hangouts. 
is in that realm. <clears throat> and it's, I mean, you, you say, I'm using the term behind, I mean, there's no direction to this. It's, it, but, for example, <clears throat> it's a place that's behind thought, emotion, and what Darwin called the uh, want machine that's cranking out desires all the time. It's behind that. So, <clears throat> you're, this is in front of it, and where's that place? Where's the witness? That witness is standing in the non-physical room, looking over at the... <clears throat> and another thing he said, it's, it's behind the personality self. Now these, when I was very young, <clears throat> Back in 1970, Darwin uh, looked at me one day and said, Jeff, you are not the personality self. It's not me. I had no place, you know, this has always been me. I mean, there's something else? You know, I said, well, I'll just file that away and see if I, <clears throat> if I grow into the uh, experience of that. And so, it's, you know, most people, this is them completely. This personality said, that's me. That's the entire of me. <clears throat> but Darwin said, this personality self, your personality self, is just a storefront for the soul. And people make such a big deal with the window displays, and they change them with all the seasons, when they can just walk in and enjoy all the priceless merchandise inside. So that's the <clears throat> one of the images he gave. Uh, I'd say the inner life is, be, is beyond uh, time and space. But it also includes space, which is kind of a paradox. I'm throwing this stuff out, and you guys can ask questions later. <clears throat> um, it's, um, <clears throat> it's like... It's beyond time, but when we were, in, most of us were in our early childhood, <clears throat> uh, we were in that very spacious, expansive, timeless experience of the present moment. So one day could last a month. <clears throat> Why? Because the present moment wasn't walled in, like it is when you're grown ups, by worries about the future or dreams of the future or walled in by. A, uh, you know, guilt about the past or nostalgia for the past. In a young child, those walls are not there. So they are living over a wide expanse in the, in the present moment. And that's where Darwin lived. He lived in the expansiveness of this present moment. <clears throat> Even though, um, and, and there he enjoyed a magnificent intimacy with Bob. But one thing that Darwin said is that we are all, as Baba lovers, having experiences of this type, whether we're aware of it or not. We are having <clears throat> much deeper experiences. I mean, Darwin would say that, you know, we would look at people and they're, they're having deeper experiences than they realize with Baba. <clears throat> um, but these experiences can be, um, become more abiding, more conscious. If you're if you're inclined that way, and but he's, he was very clear, what he was talking about is not a transcendent experience. It's about self-effacement, the state of you know, self-effacement. So it's not about realizing your spiritual self, your spiritual potential. And it's not like getting on the <clears throat> spiritual highway and heading you know off through the planes of consciousness all the way up to the summit. At the beginning of the spiritual highway, there's a little road that goes off <laughs> down to the lane of love. And that's where the lover, through love, gets dissolved in the beloved. That's the place that the Sufis talk about, <clears throat> the lane of love. Francis makes a lot of references to that. In fact, his life I mean, I look, the way I look at it, his life at Merizad is the outer manifestation of the land of love. <clears throat> so it's not about becoming 
a spiritual somebody. We're relieved of that. We're even relieved of being um, a worldly, uh, some a special worldly person. You know, <clears throat> all of that is kind of we're free of that. <clears throat> So it's, it's not, like I say, it's not a, a transcendent experience, it's something very grounded in, in, in the world. And Darwin used to say, um, sooner or later you discover you're nobody, and that is not an unhappy discovery. So you're kind of free of having to be somebody. <clears throat> now, um, I could, uh, maybe, maybe there's time, I haven't talked that long. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you how Darwin introduced a buddy of mine and I to the inner life, one of the ways. Everybody timekeeper. I know what time it is. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Well, I don't want to take it. Uh, uh, okay, anyway, I'll, I'll describe it. So, <clears throat> a buddy of mine and I, after uh, college, we were going out to visit some of our college buddies, and one of them lived in a little town that turned out to be right next to uh, Schenectady, New York. And we heard that this elderly couple who had met Baba lived there. So one day we got the nerve to call up. We got Darwin Shaw on the phone. He didn't know it was from Adam, but he said, come on over. And we went over, and we spent about three and a half hours hearing about their life, what it was like to be with Baba. And they had met Baba in their 30s and had all these experiences. <clears throat> so after about, when we left there, we were sky high, and we said, hey, we don't have any particular destination. Why don't we just put our suitcases down here? So we <clears throat> did that. Darwin got us uh, a couple jobs at the county nursing home. So back then, <clears throat> a lot of the older Baba lovers um, encouraged us younger Baba lovers, many activities, um, two things. One is, Live in the world and carry out your responsibilities wholeheartedly. And the other one was remember Baba constantly. So we put that on our banner and we headed off to this nursing home. Well, it turned out to be the infirmary part of whoops, excuse me, turned out to be the infirmary part of the nursing home. Where, you know, people were coming down to the end of their life, you know, stroke victims and people that couldn't uh, you had to give them complete care get them out of bed, bathe them, feed them, and back-breaking work. <clears throat> and the place was short-handed, you know, so... But, so we had a very difficult time remembering Baba with any depth and doing the work at the same time. I mean, it was a very thin remembrance, you might say. We were trying to combine these things. If I wanted to remember Baba with any depth, I'd just go down the hall to the bathroom and lock myself in and just kind of stand there and just... You know, try to center in bottom, and then I go back on the floor and get swallowed up by the sheer volume of work. So we did this for about a, <clears throat> a month, and we, and we told Darwin the difficulties we were having, remembering Baba and doing the work wholeheartedly at the same time. So in his kind of low-key way, he says, well, maybe you need to create a little more inner space. Now, we had read everything by and about Baba up to that point. Inner space, we never ran across that. Um, and but we were kind of you know a little shy about saying oh, what's that. Um, and then he then he described a scene uh, of, with Baba and his family. Baba called him in. They were sitting in front of him, and Baba said, "If you love me, you must give me everything, all your strengths and weaknesses, your pleasures, your pain, your good and your bad. Give them all to me. Hold nothing back, and be free. This will please me." And so we, um, you know, we picked up on that. And <clears throat> what would happen with me is I would, I would wake up with this pervasive dread in my heart. I don't know if it was that job or what. But, uh, and usually by about 11 o'clock, the dread would dissipate. So I start giving that dread to Baba. Now Darwin didn't give any directions, but you know, I just picture Baba's in front of me, and I'm letting this dread kind of flow to him. I mean, he's God, he knows my intent. And I have to kind of package it, right? So I, I started doing that, and, and the dread, you know, went right on past 11 o'clock, and the, I was feeling dread all the way until I went to bed. <laughs> then I got up in dread, started giving the dread all day to Baba, and then it never went away, and all the way the next day. It went on and on for a month. 
at the end of the month, feeling all this dread, I thought, maybe I'm not doing this right, or maybe I'm giving the dread to Bob and I'm taking it back. Whatever it is, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm just discontinuing. I mean, Darwin wasn't pushing anything like that. But anyway, right around that time, we went out to a cafeteria with Darwin and Gene, a few of us. And as we approached the front of the line, there are those dinner plates that are spring-loaded. Right? Do you have that here where you take a, a plate off and another one pops up, and you take another one and another one pops up? <clears throat> well, Baba flashed this to me. He said, you're giving me a plate of bread, and you look down, there's no change. So you, you give me another plate, and another, you know, and he said, but meanwhile, the stack is diminishing unseen below. So I... I got it. Okay, so whether I'm seeing any results from this, I should keep doing it. So I, um, so later on, I, I mentioned this to Darwin. You know, he said it's exactly true. Baba is impressionless being, and whatever impressions you give him are wiped out forever. They are gone forever. But there's a layer behind it that just like looks like the one you just gave him. <laughs> so give him that one. You go on very piecemeal, <clears throat> but uh, anything that's given to Baba is gone. You know, like I said, and, and that, that's what Baba had. But he said, the most that's not the most important thing. What the most important thing is, as you give things to Baba and they're wiped out, you're making more room for Baba to live in you. You're creating inner space. So we started doing this. Um, and after months and months, we got some space, some inner space where we could do the job and have Baba at the same time, under the same roof. Instead of having to go down to the, the bathroom and remembering Baba, we were able to do it together at the same time. So that was kind of how he introduced us to the inner life. But then he would even say stuff like, well, even the good takes up space. You know, you have to give him your good. Love is the only thing that doesn't take up space. It displaces nothing. You know? So, so good would come into this room and say, well, we need to do some redecorating, you know, and put some tape, you know, pull lamps and fix this place up. Bad comes in here, hey, party time, let's have a good time. Whereas love can come in here and accept things as they are. It's not driven to have to change things. It will change things, but it's not doesn't have the same drive that good has. So there are a lot of, you know, I don't know if that makes any sense, but anyway, that's uh, a little bit. I mean, he said a lot of things about the inner life, but that's one. So this is supposed to be a discussion. So, I mean, anybody have anything to share or say or well maybe emphasize yeah. how wonderful that book is for anyone that hasn't read it or seen it <clears throat> yeah it's really something this is kind of a road map this is a road map if you're inclined toward the inner life this this is very good and it's based on Bob's discourses but it's also from someone who has experienced these things yes and, and as part of the editorial of that book um, I find that it's, it's so um, neutral that for someone who is um, a follower of Jesus as Avatar yeah. mm. or has some other path, yeah. um, mm. I can read them something from that and they'll just absorb it because it, um, it's yeah, in a more un universal language. Yeah, um, he, he was very good. He made an effort. There's a lot of things he said uh, that were more uh, particularized. But he didn't put them in a book because he didn't, he didn't feel they were uh, uh, of universal nature. So there are other things that he said, there's things that he said to me that are not in the book, that are valuable for me, but wouldn't necessarily be good for other people. Yeah. Uh, yeah? Jeff, do you have a sense of how Darwin knew what he knew? <clears throat> I mean, of course, he came into this life with that awareness. He was very uh, proactive working inwardly. Like for example, uh, most people they wake up in the morning and they just they get the 
sun scars, they get the, the mood that they're in, and that fuels their day. <clears throat> with Darwin, you wake up, and you know, with Baba's name, or centering in Baba, and everything like that, you transmute those impressions so that by 8.30 when you go into work, these transmuted living impressions are what fuel your day, and not what you started out with. You would and talk I, about the antidotes, you would have you know, conscious antidotes to different emotions and different reactions. But he had a, a, yeah, he had a very good uh, view of the interior. So he could, you know, when you say like thought, emotion, and, and uh, desire or want, you know, he could see how people were tangled up in these different things. And he wasn't judgmental, you know, he's, you, know you, can, you can get, extricate yourself from, from all that thought. You can extricate yourself from that emotion. He was very positive that <clears throat> there's, uh, you know, that quote from Rabia, uh, dear one, why do you keep pounding on an open door begging to be let in? Well, that's kind of like, hey, the door is open. Don't feel like, oh, I got, I'm unworthy. Um, he, he, he wasn't into unworthiness. And, oh, I've done this and done that in my life. I have to kind of clean up my act before I can go in. You know, he, he was all for... Uh, when, I remember, yeah. when I remember about Darwin myself, I never had any... Uh, talked with him about, you know, like, he never shared any of that with me, and I was probably not anywhere near in that realm. But, but what was, but what I did remember, what I did, my experience, is when I used to live in Myrtle Beach, and Darwin would come down for the summer, or for a couple of weeks, and we were all, what we really looked forward to was going out to lunch with Darwin and Jean. And there was such an atmosphere around them that it was joyful, it was pure joy. We would go down to the local cafeteria where everyone was. I mean, it was a public place, was it? And we were just, we would get like, you know, like 10, 20 people from the local community. We'd all go down there with Darwin and Jean. But it was intoxicating to be around him. And his eyes, uh, uh, both of them were fun and playful. But what I also remember about Darwin is he had these incredible blue eyes, I'm not sure. And they, but they sparkled. They always were dancing and sparkling. And he, he, again, I, again, I never had any real intimate, personal, depth kind of stuff with him. Yeah. <clears throat> for for yeah. whatever reason. But it didn't matter. I just felt this. It was just yeah. pure fun to be with him. Yeah, he could have been uh, reading the Wubai phone book, name by name, and he had the same experience. <laughs> where people said that. But what about the end? You often ask some good questions. I'm just enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, when I first, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, when I first met Darwin was uh, very early 74 down at that center. And I was still in the Coast Guard, still in the military at that time. And uh, quite distraught with all that. But yeah, I could just remember him being such a, I know that we had a couple of talks and I have no idea what went on. All I just remember is his presence of Baba and his comforting feeling of uh, that it was, it was all just fine and that everything was going to be okay. And then one of the close little intimate talks he gave up in the refectory one time, um, it was just like three or four of us sitting around with him and he was sitting underneath, he was sitting in a chair underneath the uh, uh, picture of Baba holding the lamb, okay, like this. And it was right up above Darwin. And as I was looking at this and listening, um, it, it, it all melted away and there was Baba holding his Darwin mm -hmm. instead of the lamb. And that's just always mm -hmm. the feeling that I had whenever I was around Darwin. Yeah. It's very low key, and I assume. Any any questions about <clears throat> that? Yeah. Uh, you said earlier uh, about differentiating between the physical and the non-physical. There's no English comprehension to express it. But what about the word astral or sub-subtle? Well, <clears throat> well, I think that Darwin was more going to a, a, a not going up but kind of going in, uh, emphasizing that, you know, and some of that stuff is kind of up there a ways. But this is kind of at the back. 
You're staying on the growth plane, but you've got your foot in the uh, spiritual realm. So it's involution. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Baba gave um, this figure of uh, of the difference between going through the planes and his way. And uh, you gave it a figure of a tree, and you chop off, going through the planes, like you chop off the top 10 feet, and then you go down another 10 feet, and you go down. Gradually, you, you get to the, the base. With Baba, uh, he introduces uh, termites into the tree. And it just kind of gradually just eats away everything, the whole interior. So to the all intents and purposes, it looks like a tree in the gross world. You know, but then you just kind of go, and the thing will just fall over. So the mandalay and a lot of them are hollowed out. They, they were right on the gross plane, but they were completely hollowed out, as opposed to uh, in exalted states. I mean, some, uh, there were a few of Mondale that were upstairs, you know, in the penthouse or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> oh, I met um, Darwin at Myrtle Beach in the yeah. library. It would have probably been one of his last talks because he mm -hmm. was quite ill at the time. Yeah. And he just exuded love. It was just love, it was just yeah. the whole energy of the room. Just beautiful. Yeah. And he sent a video over here to Australia years before that, didn't it? There was a video of Darwin that was played um, under the um, canopy when we had the big tents then and all that. And it was Darwin on, on a video and his words came right through mm. that, that yeah. mechanism of the DVD or the video. Yeah. They were powerful. One of the things that Darwin um, uh, used to say about the personality self don't think of yourself as a base of operations. Think of yourself as a conduit, as a vehicle. Don't think, you know, most people think this isn't the base of operations. I'm in charge of this and I'm working from this spot. Think of yourself as a different paradigm so that the Baba's love and the creativity comes through you rather than from you. So he could, he, he was in touch with that great love and then his his personality self was just a shell or a, a conduit and that love could, a bottle's love could just come through unimpeded way and you know it might uh, run into obstructions going through us you know, you know. yeah i might just um, tell people that there are videos on um, youtube mm. 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 Yeah. if you haven't seen it there's a wonderful one i think it's called beloved one and Darwin and Jean are on a TV show in New York television, and they're just, and they're probably what in their 60s or something. And they were never hippies. He always wore polyester, and he would never claim anything to do with far out and this. And then he had a very straight job in the, in the um, traffic department in Schenectady. Uh, I mean, they were very straight in the, the conventional, in that, that old fashioned terminology. But on this thing, they are like the chirpiest little chipmunks. They are so high and so sweet. And the guy is just kind of awkward, the, the host. And they're just like, I really recommend it. They're shining. They're telling this guy who doesn't know what he's gotten himself into about Mayor Baba. And it's just adorable. Just, uh, but not very many people have seen it. But it's on a DVD that also has a, a short 1932 uh, a little bit of, a clip of Baba that was discovered in some archives in South Carolina, so it's like on the clip it's of that. It's on YouTube? I don't know if it's on YouTube, but you may think that maybe it's there too. We have it in our library, and you probably have it in your library, you don't even know you have it. But it's really adorable, because they're so on fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Here's another valuable thing from Darwin, if you can, if I can explain it. Uh, <clears throat> he said, uh, you know, this is your internal dynamics. He said, there's a, an invisible current uh, in everyone, <clears throat> but the invisible current of most people is going this way, toward toward me, and that the current has to be reversed. We have to flow out to life and flow into love. And you know, people may not be aware of that. You can become aware. It's in this area uh, where you can kind of pick it up in a, like an obvious way. Like suppose I'm in a very expansive mood and someone that I've had a really bad time but comes through that door, suddenly that current will stop. 
You know, so obviously there was a current that was flowing, but now it's stopping. And once it stops to that person, you have to keep working on until you get that flow going out to the, that person. Otherwise, you diminish yourself by that much. Anything you don't flow out to, you, you remain smaller. So if you don't like, you know, certain types of people, well, you're, you're making yourself that much smaller. Uh, so, but I'll tell you how it works for me. <clears throat> I wake up, uh, uh, and this is kind of translating into my own life. I wake up and my, I may feel kind of sluggish and, and everything. And I start working on that with Baba's name or centering while I'm doing my morning routine so that I get the flow going, the, the flow going. <clears throat> and, and then sometimes in the afternoon that that gets sluggish and, and I stall out. And now here's the sign for me that I've stalled out. When I've stalled out, Baba seems like he's kind of at a distance. When I stall out, um, I don't quite know what to do. So my mind comes down and gives me all these options, you know. And when I stall out, you know, life is just ordinary. But when that flow is happening, that flow is Baba. When that flow is happening, I don't have to ask myself what to do. That flow kind of leads to what to do. The mind doesn't kind of come in there, and, you know. And when that and when that flow happens, uh, the, the world has a kind of a luster to it. I mean, it has a little more sparkle than just a flat, ordinary life. So, working with these kinds of things, being aware of that, you can change the the color colors of your life. You can change your experience of life. <clears throat> That's another one. That I, don't, I don't know if you're people are working with that, but these are kind of things that you do. Super admirable. Like, I've never met two people, especially like you and Annie, get in there every day and Absolutely. just work so hard and always so happy. Like, you do not get yeah. it. I don't know how you do it. No, no, but like I'm saying, you do give me all these hot tips. But yeah. Like, yeah. God, I wake up and I dread going yeah. to work. Like, yeah, no, you yeah. got you. You work at that. I mean, yeah. he's pro. I mean, Dharma is very proactive. Yeah. You know, a buddy of mine one time we went to India and he, there were four of us. One guy was very moody and you know just kind of he just gotten out of the drugs and was kind of low hanging cloud. And we were with Baba's brother Jal in Pune. The, the three of us went on and he was hanging out with Jal and they were at a restaurant one time, and, and my friend says, Joel, you know, you're so upbeat, you're so cheerful, you're so full of life. What is your secret? Joel looks at him and says, practice. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, have to work at these things. Yeah. I, I, yes. I, was, I was saying over lunch that I actually experienced that current from Darwin. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was saying over lunch that I was sitting next to him on a bench at Myrtle Beach, and for the first and only time in my life, I felt a physical current, like a vibration between our yeah. shoulders. Mm -hmm. We were sitting shoulder yeah. to shoulder. Yeah, it was a very, very distinct physical sensation. Yeah, yeah. he was kind of emanating. What? No, that's it. He also had that spot inside uh, Baba's garden where Baba had sat, and and Darwin uh, knew of that spot. Yeah. Darwin used to love to, to sit there, and yeah, because the energy flow at that particular point was phenomenal. And it was Baba's, here's the, Baba's garden that Here was a beautiful thing uh, that happened with Darwin in Baba's garden, <coughs> and in Baba's house. In the late 40s, he was, Baba asked him to come down to Myrtle Beach from, North, uh, from uh, upstate New York <clears throat> to help clear the swamp land that was prevented uh, getting from the highway into the center. It was just a huge swamp land. But at the end of the day, he would go over to where Baba's house was going, was going to be built. And they had the stakes laid out for the house. And at the end of the day, he used to go over to a certain part of the bluff, and he would look over to India and remember Baba at the end of the day, you know, and he felt, you know, he felt like, it, you know, that it was reciprocated, he could feel it. But, you know, he was never quite sure. 
And so a couple of years later, Bob becomes, this is 1952, one day he calls Darwin and his family <clears throat> to the, his house. So they come over, and when they get there, Bob is at the screen door, and he's opening and letting them through. And as Dar Darwin's last, and as he's going through, Bob goes like that. And, and, and uh, Darwin says, Bob, you remind me how I used to come and sit here and think of you. Bob just, you know, kind of bland, like... So a lot of these things that we don't necessarily feel, you know, Baba knows about it, he does. You know, don't, don't, yeah, we don't want to be too, uh, <clears throat> too scientific about it. We may miss some beautiful experiences, yeah. Yeah, um, so imagine you've got some questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, anything that um, I what you were saying just before about um, the good being a change driven and love yeah. not being change driven and like the accepting things as they are that was like really resonated with me um, mm. just I don't know I think like especially I know um, what Baba says about good and evil, how the good is just as binding as the evil. Yeah. Um, and in that change, you might think, oh, no, I'm a good person, I'm doing all these things. But like, it can just be, like, what love is, is yet, yeah, like, the acceptance. Part. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, tomorrow, I think, it, I think it's tomorrow, I'm going to talk about self-acceptance mm -hmm. and forgiveness. Because it has, uh, has some of our elements in there that are make it more difficult than it needs to be. Yeah. Uh, that, some of that stuff I got more from Erich. Uh, okay. Jeff, is there, do you see any parallels or links between Marina Machiavelli and Darwin and the way they work? Well, <clears throat> now, Raina always liked Darwin to introduce her. I mean, you know, he said, when he first did it, he was shaking in his boots. But these, you know, very important talks that she gave in New York, Darwin would come down sometimes 30 times, 40 times a year from three hours up to introduce her, these talks. Um, and she had what Baba confirmed, a thought transmission, so Baba could speak through her. It was kind of a rare thing. Uh, <clears throat> Darwin kind of seemed to drop back into a place of quiet, and then the words would come out. It wasn't like a channeling. He, he was able to come to a quiet place, and then love would be the speaker. Love would be the doer. You, you know what I mean? Not good doing the things or, or, or whatever, but just in that state of relaxation, he would be there, and if love indicated something to do, it, it would you know, would flash out of him and, and he would carry that out even if it took 20 minutes and then he would drop back to the stillness. You know, it's a different approach to life because we're kind of trying to get in there and change things and all of that. He was... Uh, <clears throat> Is there yeah. any other... I, I, I don't know, uh, Anamandali or people who would channel Baba in that sense? Like, Noreen was the only one that Baba... Yeah, um, that I know of that he confirmed that she was doing that. Yeah, and this, I mean, I think as, as you were saying that, that it's important to note that Darwin, Darwin never channeled. It was like he just kind of went into a still place and let the yeah. love come out. Then it kind of, and, and, yeah. yeah. Mm. There, are, there are two books by Norena. <coughs> this channeling of Bob. Yeah. There are two books. I thought you wanted to know what? No, 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 that's a good question. of a spirit of diary. It's a lot of friends. But uh, if you persevere, I've got a photocopy one and one in print. Yeah, two 40 messages and what's the other one? Fragments of a spiritual diary. Yeah, yeah, fragments yeah. of a spiritual diary and, and 40 messages. They're in the library. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeffrey, there are copies in the library of Marina's. Most, most likely there are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here's an interesting thing <clears throat> uh, about self-effacement, you know, which is kind of central to uh, Darwin and the Mondo. 
But um, this, this I got from Darwin. Uh, back in 1970 or 71, Saroche, who was one of Baba's Mondelez, had been with him since he was 18 years old and everything. And his, uh, his whole main uh, practice was saying Baba's name. He was just Baba, Baba, Baba from his heart. <clears throat> and after Baba dropped his body, he came to uh, New York first. And the moment he touched the shores of New York, Darwin felt it all the way up in upstate New York, three hours away. And there were waves and waves of love that were flowing up, you know, in all directions. <clears throat> then uh, Sarosh went up to Boston, and Darwin uh, was going to go from Schenectady, to, you know, over to Boston. As he got closer, the waves of love were more and more powerful, you know, and everything. He went down the street, eventually went into the house. They went in the house, and there's Saroche. He's like, got a drink in his hand. He's reading a brochure and I'm kind of bored with things. Totally unaware of the love that's going out from him in all directions. Totally effaced, had no idea how much was being radiated out. So that, that was something that, uh, and Darwin was a little that way too. I mean, he was just walking around, remembering Bob of it. You know. Stuff was, you know, I used to call him Clark Kent. You know, <laughs> you know, because uh, he could walk around and uh, people wouldn't necessarily know who he was. You know, with his blue shirt and his kind of synthetic clothes. Or <laughs> Just, you know, where you, you were talking earlier about how the uh, Mondley uh, were all hollowed out inside. Yeah, and and I always felt that around Darwin, <clears throat> and at the very end of his life, uh, we had the fortune to go in and, and meet with him for a while, let us come in and, and see him, and um, oh, he, he signed his book that he had just put out before that, and there he's just sitting there at the kitchen table in Little River after the engine moved down there and she had died years before, and. He was a <clears throat> a translucent being. He was. He was it's just, so yeah. it's just practically amazing. not there, but like just that. emanating this love. And he recognized this immediately and in the Saturday well, talk, but it was like... Yeah. Amazing. <clears throat> so what about, what about Jean? Because I didn't think mm. either of them, and you said she was a character. So can you give she was always too hot. Bob said she was an angel. She was really uncomfortable in her body, but it took me a while to figure out that it was sort of just conversation. She was always too hot or too cold. Or you're always having to turn. Poor Darwin had to be in a house that was like the heat was up really high, but you know it was always some extreme. So he was down in a little t-shirt or you know whatever the temperature was wasn't right, and she yeah. would just grumble, but but it didn't mean anything. It took a while to figure out that it didn't mean anything. Yeah, she's no, just but, very physically uncomfortable. I'd like this, you know, this chair wouldn't be able to try to get another chair or and then start getting it. <laughs> but, uh, but she had a kind of timeless uh, look. You know, she was like, you know, one foot in that other, you know, timeless realm. Looking over at the, the circus on this side. You know, when I when I first met them, I mainly met Jean. I think Darwin might have been kind of retreating more at that time. He wanted to spend more time in the center by himself, maybe. Um, but this old lady was sitting there knitting, and she kind of called me over. And as it went on, I thought, God, somebody brought their money. This is the most boring stuff. Why she? And then as the, <laughs> As the hours and the days passed, we became buddies. I thought, man, she is just. Uh, uh, it, 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 what is she doing here? You know, and she, she's really, really adorable. Crap and really adorable. stuff she's talking about, really boring, mundane stuff. But her main, yeah, her main theme was the companionship with Baba. That was her main lesson: to keep Baba kind of like in the car seat next to you, wherever you were. And that yeah. was kind of that was her, yeah. her theme, and she would bring it up from time to time. But he, she had to live, but he was pretty much the center of attention. But we were around her a lot when she was dying, and I had only been in town like three years, which is sort of my advantage. So, because I'm sort of out of the loop of convention. Mm -hmm. So one time I wanted the times I was the only one in the room with her, and she was uh, she was seeing Bob, but she was seeing her parents. She was talking to the other side. She jumps out of the bed. She has a black wig that she always wore, and it, like went off. And she said, "Get me out of here! Tell them I want to go home." 
Mm. And I think she could tell me that because I was out of the loop. And the oddest thing was that at the same time this OJ thing was going on. And I was thinking, you know, and I went, I was OJ so bored. OJ Simpson, these chases, everyone was talking about OJ Simpson. And I'm thinking, and I wanted to get out of these boring conversations. So I'm thinking, no wonder, I can't even get out of a boring conversation. No wonder she can't say to Darwin, thanks, it's been nice knowing you for 80 years, but I'll be off. So she had to tell me. And so my job was picking people up at the airport. So I said to Leatrice, She's, she wants to go home and die. You know, and I told you know, Renee, she wants to go home and die. And, and finally, you know, we, we all told Darwin, and she said, can you really do that? Can you stop taking medicines? Can you stop drinking? Can you? Said, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right to do that, to not do what the doctors tell you. So she got to go home and die, and it was a much better death. And everybody came and sang, and it was really sad. Yeah. She also uh, is the one that raised the children and facilitated the ability of, of Darwin to be going down to New York all the time uh, and during the war and going down to the center to help build the center. And, um, and, but she also had this, as they said, this inner connection with Baba. And she, was, she always had Baba's companionship while she was taking care of the children and raising the children. So it, it, was, yeah. it was a special thing. Um, it's, sorry. It's, yeah. Time. 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 Okay. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> he, he always likes to say two things. He, and I, I, he, he really felt this is a strong message that we underestimate ourselves. Oh, yeah. Uh, really important. And Craig Reff went around the country and got the same message. He says, only people are saying, well, I'm not a good Baba lover. I kind of had my time in my 70s, but this is how it is. Baba said we really, really underestimate the what what a relationship we can have and that and he also said which also surprised me he said thousands of you are going to get god revelations he said something like ninety thousand of you are <laughs> you know just said that's the main fault of baba Lush, so they underestimate what the possibility is they feel somehow they've finished or they've let themselves down they're not trying or however you want to put it they're low on effort he used to say there are a lot of young souls and and you know he meditated he felt you know, people were kind of afraid of meditation, misunderstood about meditation, misunderstood about having a practice, about making effort. So that, that was something he... Yeah. He I did ask him one time, what is the big, biggest mistake the Baba lovers are making? You know, and he, he wasn't like a critical person, but he said, they think of themselves as small and they remain small. Think big. Think outside even the spiritual box. You know, that you know, you don't have to. You know, all well, it's going to take forever to get there. And you can yeah. say by doing that, they were. On, this song is about trusting that if what Baba says, give me everything. He really means it. He can handle it. He's the vast ocean. Oh, well, he's arms. also given us the veil. Huh? Remember that. Yeah, we want. Yeah. He's also given us. No, the but it's, it's the kind of story. I don't know. If my, one of my favorite books is When Fear Falls Away, and it's a woman who had enlightened reading experience that goes on. She says, all day long, we don't realize we're saying to God, don't worry, I don't really need you, or fine, or I'm not worthy of We're saying in many hundreds of ways, she says, God is dying to be part of us all the time, but we're actually asserting our unworthiness or some variation. And anyway, this is Hey, wait, wait, I've got, I've got something for especially the young people. Okay. <clears throat> when I was young in, in Mondelay Hall, I said to Darwin, I mean, to Eric one time, uh, what if I went out last night to a, a party and I had a wild time, I got drunk and, you know, carried on and I knew uh, Baba wouldn't be so happy with me. And uh, this morning I've got a, a headache, I'm hungover, I feel miserable. Now I don't want to burden Baba with this, I mean I'm willing to suffer what, you know, last night, what I did uh, it was my own, uh, it was my own choice. Does what Baba want me to give him my hangover? <laughs> Eric says, you know, he's you know kind of like <laughs> Yes, give him your hangover. And the embarrassment of having such a meager gift to give your beloved <laughs> will inspire the next time to have something more precious to offer. <laughs> but always give to him whatever you're feeling deep down. So I said, but uh, still, isn't that a, a burden to Baba? He said, brother, it is a greater burden to Bob to withhold anything from him than to throw on him the worst of yourself. Um, how, 
how um, Darwin says that Baba is more interested in our spiritual path than we are. Yeah. That's so encouraging. That's exactly yeah. true. But I'll say that one again, because that one, uh, that landed right in my lap. And, you know, and Baba has had to suffer, because I've given him all sorts of garbage over the years. But, you know, uh, it is a greater burden to Baba to withhold anything from him than to throw on him the worship of yourself. So don't let anything kind of say, oh, well, no, Baba wouldn't like that. Well, I better, I mean, to say sometimes people will get a divorce and they would be afraid to come to the center for years, you know, because they're just kind of embarrassed and, you know, Baba, you know, just come anyway, you know, whatever you've done, show up. It's in, the, it's in the title of that book. We've got to make the effort. Yeah. We'll always make the effort. Yeah. You can't get the grace unless you're making the effort. Yeah. It doesn't come for nothing, you have to work for it. Yeah. 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 Not just saved and then that's it. Yeah. 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 Okay, go for it. This is called Hard Part, and it's Father saying to us. <laughs> I see the look that's in your eyes that says, I must keep most of me inside, cause you'd never love me if I didn't hide the secrets of my heart. Well, I'm not here for that surface stuff. I just get bored with all of that fluff. Show me your edges even if they're rough, and let the real love start. You think your shame and deep disgrace are more than I can bear. But you can go to your darkest place. I will meet you there. I'm strong enough to take it, and I know what you've been through. You've got a whole heart. Give me the hard part. I love that too. You look at me with some surprise, and I see the doubt that's in your eyes. Like something deep inside you cries with a hunger to be known. Like a tiger born in a city zoo. There's been no place for what's inside of you. You try to live like many others do, and it leaves you so alone. I know you think that the heat of your pain is more than I can stand. Burn it all in one big flame, and I will hold it in my hand. I'm strong enough to take it, and I know what you've been through. You've got a whole heart, give me the hard part, I can love that too. Now your eyes well up with tears, as desire mixes with your fears. After so many wounded years, can you long for what you've missed? You want a cool breeze to dance with your flame, a long lost lover who knows your true name, a secret garden beyond this shame, and it all comes down to this. You think your drowning hope will die in a sea without a shore. But I can drink that ocean dry and still come back for more. I'm strong enough to take it, and I know what you've been through. You've got a whole heart, give me the hard part, I can love that too. I'm strong enough to take it, and I know what you've been through. You've got a whole heart, give me the hard part, I can love that too. I love you.